Hello, um, welcome to another session uh, with Alex. We have a special guest today. Uh, today is the uh, first day of fall 2021. Uh, still in the pandemic, unfortunately, but uh, thanks to the uh, technology, we can connect, we can collaborate. And I'm very excited today to uh, introduce to you our special guest, Stefan Schmidt, who is the CTO coach and uh, one of the most interesting things that really caught my attention uh, regarding Stefan's uh, approach is uh, what he calls radical simplicity. And I totally love that. I can't wait to hear more from Stefan. Um, and also we'd like to would like to chat with you, Stefan. There's uh, a big, big push today towards what you're advocating. And it's coming from various angles and it has few different flavors. I'm yeah, to learn, you can to learn, to learn about your views, your flavor, and then we can maybe compare with similar things. But yeah. it's shaping up to be um, absolutely essential discipline for us to get us out of this quagmire of bloated, scary, yeah, uh, you know, overarching. I call it big ball of mud, even though this architecture yeah. is supposed to eliminate big ball of mud, but I think it replaces it with even bigger ball of mud. So yeah. you, Stefan, please uh, enlighten us about your uh, views of the uh, radical simplicity. Okay, I, I dropped five sentences about me perhaps um, and how, how I arrived where, I'm, where I currently are with my opinion. So um, I teach myself programming as a kid in a department store because I wanted to write video games. Like this was at the beginning of the eighties. Um, I've been coding since then. And um, I've been a manager for, for quite some time. Um, and I'm currently, as you introduced me, I'm a CTO coach. So I'm coaching other CTOs um, to make that job easier, make them more successful and make them happier essentially. So this is what, um, what I'm doing. And this is why I arrived at Radical Simplicity, because um, I've seen smaller and larger companies, uh, smaller startups and fast growing larger startups. Um, and everything is fine in the beginning. Um, so when a small team communication overhead is, is not there, everything is fast, every, decisions are fast and, and everything happens fast, features are delivered fast. And then, then companies grow. Um, and then they tie themselves down with, with several things. So they tie themselves down with, for example, with features, with too many features that are not used, but they are still in the code. They tie themselves down with personal goals. Everyone in the company has a personal goal. Um, they tie themselves down with too many integrations. So this is marketing integration here. There's this ERP integration there. And, and so a lot of things. And the last thing is they tie themselves down with too many programming languages, microservices, um, database systems and stuff like this. So it doesn't enable them to move fast or pivot or change course or um, grab opportunities. And the fourth point with the systems and the programming languages that's countering this uh, fourth point is uh, radical simplicity. It means reducing your systems, programming languages and everything to an absolute minimum um, to enable you to be faster, easier working and be happier essentially. Great. And so um, this is absolutely the sentiment many of us share. And uh, you know, I think part of the challenge is sometimes there is a conflict of interest because if, for example, I'm a consultant and I make my you know yes. living by um, trying to fix um, all, all this chaos, then yeah. it's not in my best interest to simplify things because I squeeze yes. myself out of a job, right? So yes. we need to be, you know, uh, but like you said, and I really like how you wrote on your website that it actually frees us for tackling real problems and the real yeah. challenges. And can you talk a little bit more about what you see as the, the real problem rather than wrestling with accidental complexity? Yeah, I, I think um, with all these accidental complexity, um, developers mostly write glue code. So, so they always write very shallow features, which is just uh, like writing some code for the, for the objectional relational mapper, some code for uh, the web framework, some glue code for the REST API. So everywhere is just, you're only writing glue code. You're not writing deep code or something that I call deep code that really is um, a code that solves problems 
or that enables features that feel deep um, and uh, that are thought through and that um, um, essentially by, by being, by appearing intelligent, um, uh, wow customers. For example, today um, I, I was, I tried to join um, a meeting in Google Meet. I was one minute late. I wanted to get into the video call and Google Meet decided to, Google Calendar pre, uh, pre, um, decided to present a pop-up. Um, the calendar obviously knew that I wanted in that video call and it knew that I was one minute late, but nevertheless, um, some product manager decided or developer decided, whoever decided um, to not think this feature th through and, and create a large pop-up over the join button because they wanted to show me some new feature or whatever. I, I didn't understand, I just wanted to get rid of it. So, so that was not thought through and that was not deep. It was, so most of the features we encounter are just shallow. You know, they are just a minimum of things. They are not thought through and they are trying not to be intelligent. Um, and what I think is an intelligent feature is when I, in Google, if I type in two plus two, it doesn't search for two plus two, but it returns four. It opens a calculator and that's some kind of deep feature, you know, in, um, instead of just doing the search. But most often companies, if I, if I have a search on my website or my application, my SaaS application, I do some search, it's usually just a full text search. It's not thinking about what can the search be? What, what does the user want? It's not a deep feature search. It just tries to easily connect elastic search, you know, um, nothing against elastic search, fine product, but it just tries to connect as easy as possible to elastic search and then get the results back. It's not thought through, it's not deep, it's not a deep search, it's just some shallow clue code. Um, and, and people are not thinking about algorithms to solve this problem. So you usually do not need to think about algorithms or stuff. You use just write some glue code that, that clues some components together, which is on one hand a good thing because it enabled us to do larger systems with less effort. But if, if it's only these things, uh, then I think it's, it's too shallow. So um, what I wrote up probably on my website, um, what I'm still most proud of is um, I wrote a search engine once on by hand because it was in 19, mid of, middle of the 90s. There was no product. I needed to read um, scientific papers about how to do a full text reverse search. And I implemented this on my own um, with the index and all the data structures. And I was very proud of the result. Um, much more proud than like using Elasticsearch. You know? So that's uh, what I think um, people should do more. Deep features makes the customer happy. And also in the end, I think makes developers more happy than, than writing all this new code. So that's an excellent example, two plus two equals four, uh, that our system should be context sensitive and understand that no, yeah. I'm not searching for that string. I'm actually asking for that functionality, the calculator. Yeah. Um, so a few things that comes to mind when as I'm listening to you, one is on the negative side on, on my kind of conspiracy theory side. Yeah. I have a, uh, encountering a lot of issues with what we call the big tech. Mm -hmm. And uh, the big tech is, you know, ubiquitous and it's pervasive and it's penetrated every pore of our lives. And, you know, that's great. Like you say, it's enabling so much high, uh, larger scale and, you know, giving us power. But also I'm always keeping in mind that these people are reporting to their shareholders and it's all yes. about making profit. And so, yes. Sometimes uh, maybe it's not to the best of the consumer or general public interest, but more into the interest of the shareholders. Yeah. So, you know, and one problem I'm seeing is the, what I call monkey see monkey do. So if Google is doing it that way, if Amazon yes. is doing it that way, the yes. little startup should be doing it the exact same way. Yes. It, and this does not compute because yes. it's a completely different domain yes. and a completely different uh, surface you know, an area and a problem we're attacking. The problem that yes. Google is attacking, I will never in my life have to do that, right? And But we blindly mirror or mimic or, or monkey see, monkey do. Well, if they're successful, then if I do the same thing, I will be successful. And, yes. I, and I think that is not the best strategy, right? And yeah. the, where your philosophy steps in and you're teaching uh, and coaching CTOs, which most of them are not CTOs of Google, right? <laughs> so no. you're, you're saying, let's be realistic here and let's really focus on how do you compete in the market by offering this deep 
service that all of a sudden intuitively I feel, oh my God, this is exactly what I wanted to do. Because at the end of the day, if I'm using software, I just want to get things done. I'm, yeah. not, I'm not interested in looking at, at beautiful fonts or beautiful pictures. Yeah. I have some problem. I have some, I want to book a flight. I want to whatever. And I want to, I want to get over with it as sim- as soon as possible with least amount of frustration and stress. Yeah. And this is what yes. I believe you're talking about, the deep domain solution. Yeah. Um, yes. And, and now we're getting into this area of what, what I, I like to sometimes talk about having a butler, a software product as your butler who understands you and who could be um, yeah. maybe personalized, yes. right? Because one size fits all does not always compute, right? If you, if you make a, a product that's, that's yeah. the same to, for everyone, I, I think that's suboptimal, right? And so what's your, yeah. thought, what's your thought about this kind of uneasy song and dance between us developers and the big tech who are just trampling over everything? Oh, the, well, that's a bit big topic. Uh, I, I hope I don't get delisted uh, by Boogie. No, uh, joke aside, um, well, I'm not on Facebook. So some years ago, I don't know, five years ago, I left Facebook because I decided this is not something I need. Uh, I'm still on Twitter because I have a lot of friends there and got a lot of positive impact and, and um, feedback. So I rather I, I decide on what I what I want to do and what I don't want to do. Um, and I think people need to be conscious about what you said. In, in the end, companies want to earn money. Um, they don't want to. They are not interested in your happiness. There's this large discussion about um, about Facebook and happiness and all of these things. A lot of research going on. And in the end, they don't want to, your happiness. They want essentially they want money. So I think people should be very conscious about what they are doing with tech. And 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 all the second the second thing what you said, I, I also encounter a lot. Uh, what very said you said it as the first thing um, that that people mimic Google. Um, you know, they they all the tech departments. There are five developers there, but they want to do Google. They they want to have. Uh, they use Kafka, they use Kubernetes, they use um, all fine technologies on their own, but they try to tackle problems that are not there. They are not Google. Uh, I often tell coach, uh, coaches, um, you're not Google, um, so, so don't act like Google. Um, there is a startup a genome report, and there is a special report on premature scaling from them which explains that uh, premature scaling is one of the, the, the biggest problems in startups. Um, and I only work essentially with startups because I'm most knowledgeable there and I'm fast growing startups is what I'm interested in. Um, so so that's what I'm, what I'm most knowledgeable about. And the Gene- genome report uh, tells you that premature scaling is killing your company and uh, scaling your tech setup to something that could be Google when there are like a thousand customers and five developers does not make sense. But I see this over and over and over again. Um, so essentially, uh, Google puts out a blog post or um, or you see Spotify putting out a blog post to someone and, and then hundreds of people will mimic this um, in their search for success. And, and I think it's just because we're not confident enough as an, as an industry yet that we know what works and we're not confident in ourselves. So we try to mim- mimic fashions and what other people do um, too much. Yeah, and uh, one one almost comical example is when people read about Netflix because they have a you know pretty yes. technical blog, and everybody now wants to do Chaos Monkey. Yes, I don't know. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly you're what I thought. Stream, you're not streaming high resolution 4K, you know, content to millions of users simultaneously. Yes. Do you really need Chaos Monkey in your startup? Like yes. <laughs> that, yeah, that's yeah. that's comical, right? But another yeah. thing that I want to just mention. Um, I, I, I'm completely in agreement with your philosophy and what you wrote there, like resonates with me 100% because yeah. um, just a little bit to let you know about myself, I make my living by mm-hmm. consulting and uh, leading teams mm-hmm. to maturity or whatever yeah. you want to call it, but like to that kind of a deep um, understanding of the domain. Yeah. And uh, I, re- I review, I have to review a lot of um, products and repos. Yeah. And exactly what you said, you open a repo, you go like, okay, here's our whatever insurance pro- pro- product. And I open the source code. And like you say, all I'm reading is glue code. All I'm reading is about machinery, about some servers, about some frameworks. It, is, it takes a lot of uh, digging around 
to detect the business policy rule yes. that is actually the essence of your business. Yes. Everything else, uh, to, to me, okay. these are commodities. These are dishwashers and refrigerators and, you know, pipes. Everybody has them. It's, it's in the yes. cloud, right? So yeah. why are you babysitting so much this machinery that doesn't yeah. give you any value, uh, in yeah. particular to your business processing? Because yes. what you're yeah. seeing is your unique flavor, right? Your unique, well, I call them business policy rules, which are yeah. the rules governing your interaction with the, with the market, right? Yeah. And I, I'm always teaching them that you, you should have completely extra, extract those business policy rules and put them in a different place. Yeah, and they should be completely unaware of the machinery. It, yeah, you should have your like you say your yes. logical algorithms should be easy to find, easy to read, and understand. And this is your business, and and because this is where the real churn happens. This is where you you constantly yeah. keep changing your logic. Your oh okay, you know there's different rules, either by discovering some competitive advantage, or maybe there is a government regulation that comes in, uh, in effect, now you have to change your logic, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but when it's so intertwined, yeah. making those changes very risky because it's, it's all buried in, in a very complex uh, edifice. And, yeah. and now it's like a game of Jenga, right? You, you have to pull this out and hope nothing falls on your head. Yes. And then you, you wedge, win. And, and that's where a lot of defects come in, right? And it's so yeah. hard. And this is exactly why I'm so um, enthused about radical simplicity, because without it, it's so, and people get paralyzed. You get to a point where like, oh my God, I feel, I fear touching this because I don't know what's going to happen. Yes. You know? yeah. And so any um, maybe anecdotes or, or examples from your side, how do you deal, how do you lead teams to get to that point? I, I, <laughs> I had this discussion. So how do I get people to this point? I have always been very conscious about, about adding new technology when I was a CTO. So um, people really needed to argue uh, with me uh, to, to, to get into new technologies. And I tried to also create a culture um, from the beginning where people could uh, learn and feel important and feel fulfilled without the need for a new programming language uh, or a new system every two months. So, um, so essentially, I think it's very important to have a uh, to have the right culture there, and that people define themselves or developers define themselves and find joy by writing the code and not by adding new technology. That they do not define themselves by um, how many programming languages they know or something. You know, uh, I'm not a good programmer because I wrote code in 20 languages. That's not the point, you know, it's not adding uh, to, a, to a, it's, it's not a, a programming language, it's not a trophy. It's not some, some trophy you, you, you get and then you, you hang over your, um, uh, um, over your fireplace, yeah. you know, that, that's not, but that's sometimes how it feels, you know, I do Kafka, now I did this, I did, it often feels like a trophy. So I think that the important thing is having the right culture in the beginning, from the beginning, and then be very conscious about adding new technology. Um, when you had this discussion with the coach today, uh, what to do when you're already there, it's a little bit more difficult when you already have a very complicated setup. Um, and uh, I said, first thing is when you're in the hole, don't dig. So stop digging. Uh, you know, don't add new technology if you already have too much. So and, and create this culture and create a discussion around this and show developers that they can have fun that they can uh, develop themselves and other stuff without new technologies um, or have, a, have an experimental lab or research lab where they can experiment but try to not get this into production um, so first stop this and second what i also see quite a lot is that there are not enough product managers so what another pet peeve of mine is that uh, product management essentially in most of the companies i've seen is spread very thin so I think pulling a number out of my head, I'd say like four developers per product manager is, is a good number or two developers per product, manager is a good number, whatever in, in that region. But what I see is like five to 10 developers per product manager very often. Um, and so product management is always under constant pressure to, to keep the developers running. You know, I, I tell people, well, if the developers don't have something to do, 
uh, then play soccer or you know don't don't do shallow or stupid features just to keep developers working you know if there's nothing to work then they should play soccer and do whatever they want yeah. um and uh, so this is often from product that they are spread too thin so also another important thing is have more product managers so you can have deeper um you can have deeper uh, deeper features um or or have a better uh, uh, what also is, is dear to my heart is getting developers into product management so it's not like tell us what to do but being a team and develop uh, deep features and um, so i often got developers in, interested in product management and being a team but there needs to be more thinking about products um, by product manager or by developers so they do not uh, spread themselves thin and and only develop shallow features because if you have shallow features uh, then i have the feeling that uh, developers try to get stay curious and stay interested by getting new technologies in so if if only produces shallow features okay then i take this new shiny technology to have get the fun i deserve kind of you know yeah yeah and um, you i think you hit the nerve because my pet peeve with product managers um oftentimes <clears throat> uh th there, there's got to be a bit of elaboration on the domain beat in the US yeah. or in, and, and then I'm like, well, wh why don't we get product manager to join and collaborate? And I often hear like, they're too busy doing yeah. what? Yes. If you're a product manager and there's something of a higher priority in managing your product, what is yeah. it? I'm very yeah. mystified that oftentimes I'm here, well, you know, they're too busy. They, they cannot spend time uh, collaborating on user stories. Yeah. Excuse me. So what's your job, right? Yes. Exactly. Yeah. That. Yes, exactly. But it's also very, it's, it's, the role of the developer is clearly defined kind of it's it's write code and write tests and 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 uh, deliver but the role of a product manager is often undefined so is it elicitation discovery requirement engineering project management stakeholder management what is it uh, so often the role of a product manager is undefined in companies and they're always in some meetings and uh, they, they rarely get to the point where rubber meets the road and and only yes see and you're right because okay they just want them to work, want to hear the keyboards clacking and want to utilize the expensive developers, of course. Yeah. But they wait until it's out in the field and then they criticize, no, that's not, that's not right. But well, why didn't you fail that earlier? Yeah. Why do you have to yeah. wait? It's expensive yes. failure once you put in front of the customer. Yes. For I, that? I, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, <laughs> sorry. But no, yeah, that, yeah, to, to, to right. I think we need more product manager. I usually find that not enough um, and they should also getting back i sometimes see this under pattern from my point of view at least uh, the product manager are not product owners i think they should be product owners and own the product and own the features and decide where it goes if i own a car i decide where we go um, and that's that's kind of ownership and uh, i often see product managers which are not owning the product but only managing stakeholders so their main goal is managing all the stakeholders across the company who have some stake into the product. Um, and that can be the right setup for some things, but I think most too often um, it's not the right thing to do. Um, it's more that uh, the product monitor should be the owner focusing on getting the product forward um, and on managing stakeholders. So then they can collaborate on the user stories instead yeah. of sitting in a meeting with the stakeholders and, and, and being kind of a, nothing against secretaries but uh, being kind of a, a female or male secretary writing down the wishes of everything in the company and then going to pro to, to development and then present the wish list so that's yeah. um th this will create also uh, create very shallow uh, domains and sh shallow yeah, features exactly. and as you said if for, for, for whatever reason they find themselves under the pressure and they have to kind of abdicate their position which yes can happen then turn around and give the team the agency the autonomy to run the product on their own because they can yes. do it yeah you know you, you're 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 close to the uh, nerve right you're dealing with your front line right you're dealing yeah. with customers you learn you get feedback yes why does it have to be necessarily go all the way up the totem pole and, and some higher up decides whether you just do it and expect yeah. and see, you know, you make a change, you see if it works, if it doesn't work, you, you know, revert, et cetera. Yeah. Um, so 
we are getting more and more into that kind of collective ownership rather than yes. a single point of uh, command and control. Yes, right? yes, yes. yes. I, I don't I don't like command and control. I try to whenever wherever I've been, I try to push decisions uh, down. Yeah, it's not down, but it's uh, we have usually we visualize hierarchies in this way. Could visualize them that way, then it would be up. But usually people visualize hierarchies this way. So I say down um, to the people who do the real work. Who are, have the context, who have most of the knowledge of making decisions, instead of uh, um, uh, pushing decisions up uh, or non-strategic decisions up uh, to people who have not enough context, not enough information. Yeah, so yeah. whenever someone comes to me and asks for a decision, um, I try to push back and say, you have all the knowledge, you're skilled, um, you're clever, uh, why don't you make the decision? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah. I remember I, uh, once I saw that pyramid, uh, and the top, the CE, the, the, the executive level, uh, according to that, I mean, this is anecdotal, they have about between four and five percent of the knowledge of what's really going on out there. Yeah, yes, I, yeah. I totally would think so. Yeah. And you go down to the people in the field, they have close to 100 percent. Yes. Concrete knowledge. This is what's happened. This is what these people are complaining about. And yes. But by the time it percolates up there and, you know, in a corporate environment, we don't like the, you know, don't shoot the messenger, but you try to yeah. recode your message so you don't look like you're incompetent, right? Yes. And so the, the top guys get always pleasant news like, yeah, this is fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I have this, um, I, I, I do also do, sometimes I do uh, management workshops where when, when, when one of my clients uh, tries to promote um, they don't have middle management and they decide to promote several people then I sometimes do workshops and one slide of this is that people should be very aware of, of uh, um, that everything gets green so there is a screen facing everything you know someone in the front line says, oh that's red and then the manager says oh, I don't know um, it's probably orange I can manage it and then it goes one level up and it's it's getting yellow because someone says, yeah, it's not yet orange. I can manage it. I can, I'm good. I can manage it yellow. And then in, in the, uh, uh, everything gets, problems get greener and greener and greener. And when they are at the top, they are green until they explode. So usually as a CEO, you see all this, all this working and working and, and still it makes boom. Uh, we call it the water. Yeah. We call that the watermelon effect. Yes. Because it's green on the outside, it's growing, it's beautiful. Yes. Oh my God, it's red. <laughs> yes. Yes. It's right. Yeah. I mean, that's very interesting. And another thing that you mentioned, um, there was a one point in time where I was a CTO for a startup. Yeah. It was called Legal Opinion, and it was supposed to uh, offer uh, subscriptions like health, like health insurance, but legal insurance, right? Yeah. And uh, I was hiring various teams, and one thing I've noticed, and maybe things have changed, but I doubt you can get a team of brilliant engineers and you ask them to deliver something, they tend to deliver bloat. Have you noticed mm -hmm. that? And this is exactly what you're saying, the shallow domain. If they're not given the agency and the autonomy to dig deep into the deep, deep yeah. domain and understand really what the business is all about, yeah. they, they tend to proliferate bloat. Blo what, is, yeah. what is bloat? Accidental complexity. Yeah. so many frameworks so many languages so many products yes. so many fantastic this and that and just this big big um, house of cards yeah yes it, it keeps them very challenged very interested very excited yeah. but the, yeah. business, the, the business does not really benefit from that yeah right and I, I wrote i wrote a little bit uh, i wrote a sentence lately about i think this is kind of like sugar you know mm -hmm. it gives you a sugar high yeah. So if you if you uh, let's say I want to again elastic is a is a great product really I used it love it um, but um, um, adding elastic to your stack because you think you need it gives you a sugar high so you feel good um, one month or two weeks one month integrating playing with this new technology does things that your current stack doesn't do and it does things you haven't seen before so 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 it makes you happy. But then at a point, uh, just as sugar isn't sustainable, um, it goes away, the sugar high goes away. And then you have a, you're, you're stuck with some more technology, some part, a new part of technology you need to support, you need to upgrade, you need to um, put security patches in place, you, you need to, you forget because you 
you haven't worked with it for two weeks so for four weeks then you forget the intrinsic you need to relearn so so the the, the good feeling of a new technology uh, it goes away uh, after some time and then you're stuck with it so it's just like eating i think it's just like like having too much sugar it's it's nice but it's it's yeah bad for you in the long term yeah and the happiness goes away quite fast yeah the sugar high ter turns uh, sadly into diabetes or something <laughs> so yeah oh oh what happened i don't know ah okay we're looking good yeah that was no okay. hmm. i'm losing can you see me wait yes yeah, sorry um ah. technology um I can hear you but i can't see you so sorry okay no problem yeah so this sugar high which we call empty calories yeah yes um not nutritional very exciting and you know people are very ingenious and people can really create fantastic things but the in the context of business solution i see that as bloat unnecessary yes. complexity yes um so one thing also that is the problem with this arrangement because my philosophy my approach is uh, i don't differentiate between building and testing i think Yes. When you're building, you're testing. When you're testing, you're building. Uh, sadly, mm -hmm. not a profession has been severely separated for some reason. Yes. Which is not the case in other engineering. But anyway, here we are. So I'm teaching that, you know, I, I'm teaching TDD dojos, you know, where yeah. you test first. You write one test, you see it fail, then you make it pass, then you refactor. That, you know, that's yeah. Like, and uh, that's great in theory, but when it comes to actually actual work, it is really challenging yes. to do that if you have this bloat, <clears throat> right? Yeah. Because, because now you, you have created such tight coupling with all these frameworks and yes. things that people don't know how to write a test. Yes. And if they write a test, this test is humongous and it's super complex yes. and it's, it's yes. counterproductive. It defeats the purpose. And yes. so another reason why I'm a big fan of radical simplicity it suddenly opens up a very clear road to this test-driven yep. uh, development, right? Yeah. So any thoughts on that from your side? So I'm not, I, I try to, I read the initial test-driven development book. I tried to do test-driven development since then. Um, I, write, I wrote, the, I read the very good, the word of ThoughtWorks anthology, I think, with some very good points about test-driven development. I always try to do it, but it's just not my thing. Um, because because I'm, I experiment a lot with code until, until it feels right. And I kind of feel like writing all the tests that I throw away or change because I don't, just don't know how the API looks. And I know test-driven design should help you drive the API design. But for me personally, this hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, um, um, as soon as I, um, I'm a huge proponent of more tests, um, and as soon as I have the feeling that my API of the classes and stuff has kind of stabilized, not finished, but kind of stabilized, that's usually when I, uh, I'm, I'm writing tests and, and where I think developers should write tests, at least where I'm responsible for. And I know others do TDD, yeah. but uh, where I'm responsible for, I, I expect people to write some tests when they kind of know what they're doing um, and the experiment phase of, of writing classes is over. Um, and, and what I have seen is, but the second part is identical to, to your experience, I think, uh, because um, whenever, wherever I've been and looked into, um, test setup is so complicated that people do, want, do not want to test. For, for one thing that, um, their, their, uh, all the frameworks and everything is tied into their uh, domain code. So that's one of the things. So that's something you can learn from functional programming is pushing the effects to the side and have only your, your domain code essentially in place. So what I'm advocating for years now is really having plain use case classes, which are called use case, like new user use case or uh, disable account use case or something which is really essentially only domain logic, uh, which I, if needed, I could talk about the code to a product manager and the person would understand it. Um, so, and so, and have everything else somewhere outside on, on, on the out, on some outer shells. 
um, and have this business logic in the core um, to make it more easily testable. Because wherever I look, they and I say, why do, don't you test more? Yeah, we need to have um, we need to set up again the elastic search in, in 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 a Docker. We need to have Postgres in Docker. We need to have a Redis doc. Docker, we need to, in, and then we have some orchestration which pulls up all the Docker images for this test environment. So if you want to just run an end-to-end -end test, um, then uh, we run once some testing, you need a really huge complex test setup. If you are radical simplicity, if you only have Postgres um, and a monolith, um, then it's very easy to test. You know, it's just like very easy to test. And if this monolith spits out HTML, uh, which I'm again, became a fan again after all these React, doing a lot of React Angular and stuff. It's just the backend spits out HTML. This is also very easy to test, you know? So it's, it's, it's uh, and I only have one test framework. I don't need to have like, like a front end test framework and a back end test framework and a test framework for this language and a test framework for, for that. So it's much easier to test, it's much easier to set up. And if the barrier to test is much lower, then people write more tests. And if it's very high, and you need a very complex setup, um, or you need to mock a lot of things, and then you, you, you create a simple mock, but then this needs to have this edge case, this edge case. So I have seen very elaborate mocks of, um, that, that try to replicate behavior of, of, of systems, um, and then they rebuild kind of the system to in a mock to replicate uh, this other system. Um, so, so uh, with a complex setup, it's very complex to test, and uh, as you said, and, and, and that prevents often prevents people from writing a test. They don't know where to start. You know, they don't. What's the first step? Because it's to get the first test running, it takes already a lot of effort. Yeah, absolutely. And um, another thing, even if they know um, what to test and all that, and know how to write it. I've noticed if those tests are slow, yes, then they, yes, and okay. So you 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 make a change, you run your test. It take a long time. You go grab coffee. It's still running. Yeah. You you will be reluctant to write an, yet another test, which makes yes. it slower. Yeah, and that is uh, that is also shooting yourself in the foot, right? So like yeah. this, it has to be light. Uh, uh, what's the word? Small footprint. It should run yeah. fast, and yeah, you need to write more tests. Which again, yeah. radical simplicity. Uh, yeah. it, it encourages and invites you to write more tests rather than yes. say, you know what, this is so bulky and clunky. Let's, you know, we'll we'll, we'll ask QA to test it manually. Yes. After that, right. So yes. I just wanna few things that um, I've been looking uh, into for a number of years before I, uh, I ran into your radical simplicity, and I don't know if you're familiar with. One is the, um, and for the longest time, I've been really fascinated by this and I'm doing it. Uh, Alistair Coburn's hexagonal architecture. I don't know if you looked into that. I think I read about it, uh, but it's quite some time ago, I think. Yeah, so uh, this is this is really, uh, I think, proposing the exact same thing you are doing. Yeah. With, with the only difference that it, uh, really the focus is on creating this uh, core competence um, kingdom yeah. That, that lives in the memory, yeah. and completely ignorant of the outside world. It has yeah. no idea what's happening outside. Yeah. All, all it does, it receives the, some values and it transforms them and then it sends them out. Yeah. They have no idea where the values come from, how do they come in, and they have no idea where the values going and who's gonna. And now yeah. this is hexagonal architecture, which is based on uh, call, also called ports and adapters. Mm -hmm. So, you, you know, you, you have your core competence, which is your business algorithm, your how your business runs. And it's very abstract. It's based on yeah. that values and events. That's all, nothing else. Yeah. The machinery that, that from the outside that makes that happen, the various devices, is it command line interface? Is it coming yeah. via HTTP? Is it coming via SMTP? Is it coming from, you know, it's ir irrelevant. Yeah. And I, I think there's a lot of... Uh, potential in that to, to collaborate with your radical simplicity of yeah. course it, it offers no recipe for the outside world the outside world whatever it is and i think you uh, you have a recipe for uh minimizing the um number of moving parts on the outside world, yeah right 
and simply yeah. the attack surface. So like you say, we have only, only Postgres, you don't need anything else for all this yeah. very functionality, maybe Redis, right? But yes, for, uh, for a lot of people, it's just, a, uh, it's just, it's just a minor point. If you need Elasticsearch, use it. If you really need uh, Kafka, use it. So it's not, radical simplicity is not, it's on the point is, yeah, use very few systems. Um, but be conscious about what you're using and use the minimal valuable valuable systems kind of right, um, right. that that works yeah so I, I find the marriage of your approach and uh, hexagonal architecture mm -hmm. is, is a very uh, promising uh, approach and uh, you know uh, like you say you should use you should start really simple and only if you have hit the point where you absolutely cannot grow anymore yeah. without then you add a new component yes but you have yeah. to be really convinced you have to buy into yeah. that. not just because yes. it's so exciting and you read this blog post and man this is fantastic and you just pull yeah. it so that's one thing another thing i wanted to ask you is yeah. have you heard of the dark lang the dark platform no i don't think so ah, okay so it's really interesting um yeah um You've heard of, uh, I think it's called Travis or no, CI, uh, the, the, the continuous integration platform, CI Circle, CI. This one is called Travis and one is Circle, circle, circle yeah. CI. Yeah, the CI. So the, so the guy who wrote the CI, very successful, mm -hmm. I think he uh, sold, sold that and, and, and got a, a little bit of a cash. So he invent, invested in dark platform. Mm -hmm. What dark platform is, is the anti Unix philosophy, where mm -hmm. in Unix, you, you know, you, you have millions yeah. of things that you just yeah. stream together. And yeah. uh, his, his is like a monolith, like one stop mm -hmm. shop. You go yeah. to dark and uh, you have everything there. It's absolutely, mm -hmm. everything's baked in. But the most interesting part is that it has its own language mm -hmm. where it, you cannot uh, create a wrong line of code, not possible. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I love. It's mm -hmm. not because my one of my beef, my, my pet peeves with software engineering yeah. is uh, code as text, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, computers don't understand text. They need intermediate, mm -hmm. right? And so when I'm, <clears throat> if I go and I make a diff, uh, I don't get any feedback. Mm -hmm. I only get feedback when I run and if I have tests and whatnot. Mm -hmm. In the dark, you get immediate. You, there's things you can't do, right? It's the same as you're mm -hmm. working with real life material. Like if I'm making a guitar and I yeah. take a, a piece of wood, there's only so, I mean, it's telling, it's giving me immediate feedback if I'm mm -hmm. gonna try to bend it, even a break, right? Yeah. In software, we don't have that feedback. I'm working in dark. Yes. It's almost like if you go to Ikea and you buy a uh, mm -hmm. cabinet, you come home, yeah. now you have to assemble it. But imagine assembling in a, in a dark room. You're feeling your way. Yeah. You, you put some screw in here, you then you flip the switch on. It's like, oh my God, this is all crooked, right? That's how it yeah. feels for development. So yeah. if, you, if you go in and check dark, it, it is more, it, it is really giving you immediate feedback. Mm -hmm. Like if you try something wrong, it's going to push back, right? Yeah. And furthermore, when you when you get your logic in and all that, you, you don't have to worry about anything, storage or any other, everything's taken care of. It's running for you and uh, it's amazing. It's I yeah. think something you should check out because it's to me it's ready yeah. because uh, Paul Paul Bigger is the guy. He's brilliant, and I actually I have mm -hmm. an episode with him in my channel if you want to. Okay, yeah, we'll take a look. Uh, amazing things, uh, yeah. and also the third thing is uh, I was chatting with you, you know about Kent Back, right? He, he yes invented extreme programs. Yeah, kind of back and forth with him. Um, his vision of the future is that software development should be like if you're collaborating in Google Docs. Like let's say mm -hmm. you and I and you guys are collaborating on a document. Um, you make changes, I see them in real time, right? There's no mm -hmm. continuous integration. There is no like a lag, right? Yeah. And more, more significantly, you cannot break the doc. Yeah. You cannot make a change that's gonna break it. So the idea is the software, if we're collaborating on, on a program, uh, that we should have um, a tool or a platform where you, you, you can't break it. You can make changes, mm -hmm. right? But you cannot break it. It, it always yeah. is, right? And furthermore, it's always live. It, it's yeah. like every keystroke is live. It's in production. Uh, 
Yeah. This is the future that I want to see, right? Mm. Where we can, um, to avoid this, another access and complexity with the, all these pipelines and all these like gates yeah. uh, and pull requests and all this like really not agile, right? It's, it's really pedestrian. So yeah. that's why I'm excited about your radical simplicity as well, because it's kind of converging to that place mm -hmm. where we, we are really making, we are, we are makers, we are making products and automating, but it's, it's real time, right? Yeah. And, and collaborative. I, 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 I'm a little bit skeptical. Um, I haven't looked into it. I will look into it. I have a look. Um, um, what I found, I, I did also a lot of, um, uh, no, two, two points or some points. I did a lot of research in, the, in um, like 20 years ago. Um, I did a lot of research in UML. I was work, working as a researcher. We did a lot of executable in UML and we were thinking about a lot. The point was about aspect oriented programming in, with executive uh, executable UML. And uh, we did a lot of thinking about re how to represent things. So how do we represent things? And because there was a huge push for UML back then. Um, and what I've learned is that representing rules, text is a good point, a, a, a dense, a, a good dense uh, way to represent rules. So it's, it's, it doesn't need to be perhaps characters where what we currently do. So I need to write, um, I don't know, then as a, which is essentially a token, but I, I write for characters, but it's a, it's a code token in the, in, in the programming language. But, uh, but this is, it's, it's very, text is, is easy to, to read because we read. So it's, it's easy to fast read. Um, and it's good to move around with cut and paste and stuff like that. So it's, it's very, it's a good representation of rules. It's a good medium to represent rules. And a lot of other stuff I've seen uh, look very nice with um, in a small setup, but breaks down when there are um, 10,000 rules or 100,000 rules. Uh, then I think with, with like, like I've seen a software that works with, uh, with 2 million lines of code and, and people could navigate and work there. Um, and, and so, so I, I'm skeptical a little bit about the representation. Nevertheless, um, I've also teached a lot of uh, programming in different environments. I made some um, coding for manager work, for, for example, to, for marketing managers and finance managers to, to teach them coding. Um, so they have a better interaction uh, with, uh, with, with uh, essentially with me. Um, and um, and with, with development and stuff. Um, and I also teach other people coding. And what I learned is a lot of people start coding with Python or with, uh, with C or whatever and teach coding. And people struggle a lot with uh, just with the syntax and just with, this, um, with getting the syntax right and, and not writing a syntactically wrong program. Uh, you, you're talking about semantically right programs, but, but they struggle with syntactically uh, right programs. And what I learned is um, I've used, later I used just use Scratch uh, where you can drag and drop and there is an if, and then the if has two, uh, uh, two empty spaces where you can drag another thing in and you can't drag an expression there, but you need to, uh, uh, you can't drag an expression. You can't drag a command there, for example, you know, expressions are, I don't know, uh, triangles and commands are squares and you can just put a, in the if a, a triangle. And, uh, and that made a lot of people learning programming much easier for them because they, they, they do not struggle with writing wrong programs like when they start with Python or something. So, so it was very useful having a different representation instead of text. Um, and I can imagine that we find something that you meant, mentioned, which is not a representation of text, which prevents this and still scales to 10,000 rules or 100,000 rules um, that, that we have. Yeah, so I'm not uh, saying that text should be get rid of, but we should transform the um, platform so that we get immediate feedback. Yes. Which is what you're describing. Yes. The longer the feedback, the lower the quality of our work. Yeah. That's as important. Yeah. Yes. If you get immediate pushback, then your work will be going up in quality, that's. Yes, and it's astonishing that I, I, I use this, um, I don't know the name. I use this, uh, when I was writing JavaScript, I use this a lot, and TypeScript, I use this a lot 
uh, which is running your tests in in real time and and they also have a product which is a playground and you write uh, typescript code and javascript code and it evaluates it in real time um, and you see and you can edit it you can edit a line and it changes the results and expressions in real time um, and it runs the test in real time and i thought and i really enjoyed that i don't remember the name now I, i'm very bad with names but you can probably everyone can google it um, and and that really felt different so i would not write javascript front-end code or javascript code without that tool anymore yeah. you, you know you have tests and they run in real time and and you see what breaks while you're editing while you're writing tests it's not what you express but it's going in the right in, in the same direction and it was really really helpful yeah exactly and so i um two months ago i hosted and i organized and hosted uh, the first international tdd conference and yes a lot of good speakers and my um my presentation was about TCR, which is uh, an, a next level of uh, TDD, which basically yeah. is uh, what I call self-healing systems. So mm -hmm. if you make cool. any diff to your code, yeah. and any, even one of the tests break, it just reverts back to the previous healthy state automatically. Yeah. So you don't have to yeah. go and say, oh, no, what's wrong? No, no. You know, and it's it's a more immediate feedback. So the, the moment yeah. I make diff, uh, Either if it passes, okay, it's added. Now the system is in a new healthy state, or it just reverts back and you're back to where you were, which is everything is running fine. So that encourages really small. Yeah, that's interesting. Step. Because now you're discouraged from making big diffs because you, you're yes. losing, losing a lot of your work. Yeah. And that indeed hones your quality of your code because you're making tiny little steps and every step of the way, like, yep, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Oops, okay, you know, try again. And so your system is always up and running. And I think that yeah. the, trick. the trick is to never let the code not be working. And I see some people for long stretches of time making a lot of diffs and never check if it works or doesn't work. <laughs> yes. And then it becomes more problematic to see whether your system is healthy or not. Sometimes it, it slips into production and then you realize a defect and it's a costly mistake, right? Yeah. So yeah. all these things really combine together to, I think, hopefully promise us a more stable, uh, more satisfied, you know, like you say, happiness on the job. I'm, yes. I'm making, now I have, now I have time and I'm relaxed to really focus on what is it, the change that I'm making that is going to yeah. make a difference and is going to yes. improve things for people. Yeah. How did me spending 99% of my, my time wrestling with Kubernetes and Docker and all oh, of this is not, yeah. you know, and at the end of the day, I'm burned. My, my brain's yeah. fried. I have no time yes. to think about the business. Yeah. And unfortunately, the bosses are happy to see us keeping the lights on. But are we really, yeah. are we adding much to value to their, I mean, we're we are, we are getting paid a lot of good money. Yeah, yes. For what, right? For keeping the lights on, for keeping the Kubernetes yes. happy and orchestrating and choreographing. Yes. So what? And you know? it's instead of and, and what I say is in, instead of changing the world and making the world a better place by by writing good software, which is with deep features, we only keep uh, Kubernetes and 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 Revit and Q and all of these systems and Elastic and and, and Redis running, you yeah. know. For, for, yeah, it, so we spend a lot of time that we could use to to have a positive impact. Yeah. So we we bring all these systems and things to serve us, and then we become their servant. Yes. If they had to turn yeah. over the tables and now yes. I'm, I'm their bitch. I, I spend the whole day babysitting them and, and making sure yes. everything is happy, change the oil, rotate tires, this and that, keep the lights on. This is menial work. And I don't think yeah. that it's not dignified work. Uh, yes, exactly. Work. exactly. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a dumb uh, operator. I'm just yes. jigging the cables. And th this is not the place where I want to be, right? Yes. And yes. So many people think that this is it, right? And that, that's yes. And then this leads to often people then get um, dissatisfied, and then they try they try to change jobs. So they change jobs yeah. uh, because they're unsatisfied with their current job, but they uh, but they change into a job which is exactly the same. They are just again babysitting different technologies. So it's yeah. not you know that the the, 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 the the context doesn't change or that the picture doesn't change. It's just and then they move to another job again uh, because they're not ha not happy. But the reason for their unhappiness is not that they are not using the right technologies, but they are writing blue code and babysitting uh, systems. Yeah, 
And I think, I think the keyword here is blue code. We need to be more, talk more about that in general. Yeah. Because yes. somehow, um, one of the reasons I like to test uh, driven and test first is I've noticed that teams that are doing that have pretty much eliminated debugging. Because mm -hmm. TDD is debugging in reverse. Mm -hmm. Like if you write code first and you're yeah. confident and then you run it and then you realize it's not working the way you expect it. What do you do? You put the breakpoint, you start debugging. What is debugging? Yeah. It's taking small steps and with each step yeah. you're examining values. Well, that's what TDD is, but you do it before you write code, not after, right? So it's, but to me, debugging is a non-productive activity. Yeah, I've seen people spend days debugging some yes. scary code, and businesses are happy to pay them. But to me, you know, if I'm debugging, I feel like I'm stealing from my employer. Yeah, because I'm I'm not producing anything. All yes. all I'm doing is, I admit that I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> I was and I see. <laughs> and the funny thing is, I, I, at least I find find it funny. Kind of is a lot of uh, companies I work with. They are outsourcing. Uh, outsourcing software development by the day, kind of, by, by the day rate, not with a project price. So, uh, so the the outsource company, nothing against outsource company. There are really good ones out there, uh, work with really good ones. But uh, but they are sometimes they are not aligned with you. So they write bad code. Um, you pay for that. They debug for days. You pay for that. You know, this is like uh, <laughs> there. It's obvious. It's not that obvious with uh, with uh, your own employees. But it should be very, it's the same, but it uh, should be very obvious uh, when you have outsourced work and they, you pay them uh, on a daily basis and they do debug stuff they should have written, perhaps with TDD correctly in the first place. Yeah, because it's the same thing. The only thing is uh, also you cannot reuse your debugs, debugging session, but you can reuse your. Yes, testing. you're right. You know, so it's yeah. really, um, but the problem is that. Bosses keep the keyboard, key, they hear the keyboards clacking, they think yes. it's productive work. Well, yeah. realistically speaking, you know, I did some poll, polling between my colleagues. How much time do you actually spend writing code? And it's like 10% on average, some yeah. less. Yeah. And that's the only productive activity because that's what we're, you know, companies are paying yeah. for is to write code. Yeah. The rest is what we call geek at keyboard. You know, you're yeah. running, you're you're compiling manually, running it manually. Then you you log in with these credentials. Yeah. You, you log with these credentials. You do some testing. Then you log out. You use different credentials. It's all wasting. Yeah. Wasting. All that could be done with tests automatically. Yeah. And it was in split second, right? That's why I'm a big advocate of writing tests first. You know. Yeah. And then you have all that plus you have the safety net for regression. Right, then you always yeah. play your entire. Um, and it's, it's no, I could not work without tests. So I'm not, as I said, I I can't make TDD work for me. But nevertheless, I can't work without tests. I would not, I I, I would not work like to work in an environment where there's not a high kind of test coverage or or a testing culture, because then I can feel confident to change things. Otherwise, I would always be, yeah, yeah, anxious that that things break. Yeah. So yeah. Exactly. And when I teach and I say, uh, never let the code not be working, then people raise hands. Well, what do you mean by working? I mean, not just compile and run, but all tests pass. To yes. Me, and all tests pass, yeah. the code is working. If I don't have yeah. that step, I don't know if it's working. Maybe it's counting yes. from one to 10 and back. Yes. Okay, compile successfully. It's running. Nothing crashes. Is it doing something useful? We don't know. Yeah. You're just yeah. Doing and whenever I wrote tests afterwards or the team wrote tests afterwards, um to, to to write more tests we've always found bugs always like like I, I never when i wrote tests afterwards for some piece of code because it hasn't been done during development i had no time at well, for whatever reasons um i let myself be pressured into not writing tests which is a shouldn't do that but i have got myself pressured into this uh, and then i write tests afterwards i always find bugs so ne there's never been a time when i write tests and i haven't found bugs yeah, guaranteed. Yeah. So this is uh, this has been a phenomenal discussion. Thank you so much, Stefan. And I, I learned a lot and I'm sure. I've... Me too. Yeah, awesome. I learned so, a lot and I tried it a lot. Yeah, so great. Um, very excited about what you're doing. And let's combine forces. Let's uh, connect with Paul, with all these people, Alistair, who are, who are making these things happen. Because we yeah. want to create this strong 
uh, engineering culture that is really focused. Yeah. Like this, yes. I like your term, deep domain, avoid glue code, which is not productive at all. Yeah. Uh, try not to become the, you know, like we, we, we get these phones and what they're supposed to serve me. But guess what? Yes. I'm the hamster in the wheel. I'm serving this machinery. Yes. Yeah. Shameful, right. And we should, we should grow up and, and say, look, I, I demand that the machinery serves me. I'm the human. Being. Yes. Yes. That's why you're doing a really good ethical work. I think this is ethically very strong statement and I support you hundred percent. If you Thank any you. help you need, please call me. I'll jump in immediately. I will. Thank you. And uh, I hope we can have another session soon maybe come back if you, if you, when you look at dark and um, yes other things let's uh, reconvene let's compare notes and see yep. how we can further this and uh, mm -hmm. propagate this way of thinking yep and we'll also right teach the business teach the business of uh, look uh, do you even care about what you're paying for like you're, you you should be demanding more quality you shouldn't be just happy that somebody's keeping the lights on and kubernetes is spinning yeah yes awesome thank you very much stefan uh, Thank you, Alex. And recording, and uh, we'll we'll chat soon. Yeah. See okay. you. Bye from Bye. Bye bye.